All right, welcome to the first lecture of Foundations of Computer Science. Um, in this class, um, these audio, these lectures are sort of supplementals um, where you'll do the main uh, lecture content. I recommend looking at the book. Um, and then we have uh, a Reddit for discussion. And then during the scheduled class times, we'll have um, meetings to discuss things. Um, in those meetings, I'll sort of give a bigger introduction to what the course is all about um, and how to navigate uh, the site and the syllabus and things like that. Uh, I want these videos to be more focused on just the actual content. So the whole idea of this course is to um, talk about um, really what computers are capable of. So let me make a little note right here. Um, by the way, um, these notes will be upload are up are available online, um, and they always start with the class that we're in, and then um, which page of the notes we're on. So what this class is about is about um, what computers can do. Can do, meaning um, you know what is possible for computers. I think that we, most people, have this assumption that humans can kind of do anything. Um, this is sort of like the enlightenment way of thinking, that anything that is conceivable um, is within the, the grasp of humans if we just worked hard enough doing it. Um, and in some sense, this class is all about trying to prove that wrong by demonstrating that there are certain problems that are sensible problems that someone might wish to have done, but are actually not possible to do. And we do that through the vein of computation. Now, there's another angle on this, um, which is that um, when is an algorithm correct? When is an algorithm correct? So, for example, you know, you can ask the question, um, you know, uh, how can you, you know, can a computer sort a list? That's sort of in this first question. Now, suppose that you believe that computers can sort a list, and I give you a particular algorithm for doing that sorting. Then you could say, well, how do I know that this algorithm is actually right? Because, um, you know, I could, of course, tell you some, you know, ridiculous instructions for sorting a list that don't actually make sense. So another related question that we'll talk about is when is an algorithm correct? And kind of another angle on this is what is... A program. So this one is what is possible. This is when is something correct, and this is what is something just to begin with. So these are three related questions that all have to do with the idea of computation. Now notice that in this one we use the word computer, here we use the word algorithm, here we use the word program. Um, in common discussion these are all um, like these are distinct things like normally when we say computer we mean some like physical piece of hardware like the computer that you're watching this on when we say algorithm we typically mean an idea um, that you know you might write in pseudocode or something like that but it's not a physical artifact it's not a computer but it's also not a software program and we, when we say program we typically mean a piece of source code probably that's been compiled and runnable that can actually really run and do something now one of the things that we'll talk about is how all of these ideas, computer, algorithm, and program, are really identical from the perspective of mathematics and computer science theory. Um, take, for instance, a program. What's really the difference between an algorithm and a program? Is not an algorithm, when you think about it in terms of pseudocode, just like a bad program? And when I say bad, I mean that it's not, like, you can't really run it because it's just some text, you know, written in English somewhere. And so maybe an algorithm is sort of like this broader class of different kinds of programs. So this is sort of a way of saying, when I say that an algorithm is a bad program, that sort of identifies the thing that's in common about them, but then denigrates the algorithm because it can't really be run. On the other hand, maybe the thing that's good about thinking about an algorithm is that it's somehow more broad than a particular program. For instance, the idea of quicksort is clearly a coherent idea that is independent of quicksort implemented 
in Java versus Quicksort implemented in C versus Quicksort implemented in Python. That is a meaningful thing to say that Quicksort exists independent of those implementations. So perhaps the thing that's important about algorithms is that there's somehow like a higher level perspective on what programming uh, or you know what a programming idea is about. Although again, maybe you could just say then that programs are really just bad algorithms um, in that programs make you think about all sorts of little bitty details that are annoying to think about and it's the algorithms that are the more fundamental, more beautiful thing to think about. Similarly, computers may be more, like how can we think about computers relative to these? You know, a physical computer, in one way, it's kind of like a really, really bad program, right? Because it can only do one specific thing, it was really hard to write, that kind of thing. Um, and computers seem to be more low level than either algorithms or programs. But when we think about what is possible for, computa for computations to do, clearly if something is a computer, then um, it is running programs, so therefore it can do the same thing as programs. And an algorithm is really only meaningful if it can be realized inside of a program. So this is the main kind of um, uh, rubric that we'll think about in, term in this class. Now, um, the material in this course uh, goes back to really the early days of um, mathematics. When, no, when I say early days, I don't like mean 2,000, 4,000 years ago. I mean um, like 100-ish uh, years ago, around um, the beginning of the 1900s, um, where people were really concerned about these questions, about what, um, about, about each one of these, although they phrased it in terms of mathematics. They ask questions like, um, like, um, what, uh, what can math do? What can math do? When is an equation, when is an equation true? Which sets really exist? and similar questions. And this whole field was called formalized mathematics or mathematical foundations. Mathematical foundations. And I'll be um, mentioning lots of people involved in these kinds of questions as we go. Um, but I, and, and this kind of question, this kind of angle, the mathematical angle is really where we start. Um, when we study the foundations of computer science. And I'd like now to do a little bit of a review of some fundamental pieces of discrete math that we'll use in this course. Um, and some of this will be review, some of it won't be review, but even the stuff that is review, I may go over it in a slightly different way that um, appeals more to how we'll be thinking about things in this course. So let me open up a new page. So one of the fundamental things that we'll deal with in this class is um, the idea of a set. So a set is a bunch of stuff. When I write things in quotes, I'm being um, really like obvious about talking about things in terms of English prose as opposed to math. Now normally when people think about sets, um, they will think about the particular notation that is often used to talk about sets. For instance, they think about writing a curly brace and then something like, you know, pen and tablet and then a closed brace. And they would say, this right here is a set. It's a set that contains pen and it's a set that contains tablet. And um, this, is the, this is the way you write that set. Now, this is okay, but I want to push a little bit more to talk about the idea that there can be many different representations for the same objects. So a set is an idea, each set that is, is an idea that exists somewhere in the universe, perhaps in the universe only inside of our brains. And this right here is one way of writing down that particular set. Here's another way of writing down that particular set. We could write down tablet, pen, 
And it's the same set, but we've written it down a different way. Here's another way of writing it down. Here it's the same set, but now I've, I've drawn a picture of a pen right there and a tablet right there. All these three things are the same sets, except that we've written them down with different representations. On this side, we have two different ways of representing the set itself, because um, sets are indistinguishable no matter what order you write down their elements in. And over here, I've written them down in the same order as this one, but the objects themselves, I've used a different representation of the object. Here I use the object's name, and here I do the object's picture of it. There's another way to think about this set, which I can't write down, but it is I'm closing my eyes and I'm picturing the essence of penness and the, ep and the essence of tabletness. And those things combined together, that is this set right here. Now, obviously, those are sort of like weird ways of thinking about different representations, but we're going to play a lot in this course about the concept of different representations of the same objects. Now, it's very common um, to have a small number of um, primitive operations that define um, some category of objects. Um, and technically, these things are called like an algebra. Um, but let's ignore that for a moment. There are certain fundamental sets that um, are very useful to talk about. So for instance, one fundamental set is called the empty set, and we write it down like this. So it looks like a zero with a slash through it. So this is the empty set. Now, this right here is one representation of the empty set. Another way to represent it could have been like this. And there's also the representation that's just in my brain. Now, the question that you always want to ask about sets is, what is in it? And the way that we ask that question is we write down, um, we, we, we uh, write down the thing that we're interested in, so let's say pen, and then we ask the question, is this inside of some set? That little symbol right there is called the set membership symbol. And I can ask this question. So is pen inside empty set? And the answer here is no. Because the thing that defines the empty set is that nothing is in it. So we can write that down as a formula in the following way. We can say for all x, x inside of the empty set is false. And so this statement right here, this for all, perfectly defines the empty set. It is the set that everything is not inside of. Now, from this, we can start talking about more operations that define sets. Right now, we have the empty set as sort of like a fundamental building block of sets. We have the set membership symbol, which is useful. Now let's look at another symbol, or another um, part of the building blocks of sets. There's something called the singleton set. The singleton set. In the singleton set, you write like this. There's a brace. There's an element, like x. And then we close it. And so that is a set that contains exactly one thing, x. So we can define it in the following way. We can say, for all y, y is inside of x if and only if y is equal to x. So this symbol right here, if and only if, means that these two statements are equivalent. x being equal to y is the same as y being inside of the singleton set. So notice that what we're doing is we're coming up with a way of writing down sets, writing down their representations, um, and we're coming up with formulas that define their meaning. So this right here is the fundamental process of mathematical foundations. You define a mathematical idea, and then after defining the mathematical idea, um, or sorry, a notation for it, let's say you write down the notation, and then you uh, define its semantics, what it means. So let's look at another um, set tool. It's called a union. So a union is an operation that operates on sets. If we were to write it down in like a programming language, we would say that it takes a set 
another set and returns a set. We can think of it that way if it, if it does something. Another way to think about a union is that it is something. So union we also write down with this big U. So we could say A, that's one set, union B is a set. Okay, now which set is it though? Well, the way that we know what set it is is based on how it behaves with the set membership. So the following is true, the following defines union. We say that X is inside of A union B, sorry, for all X, X is inside of A union B if and only if X is inside of A or X is inside of B. So essentially what union does is it takes the idea of orness and it puts it inside of our set notation. Now, something that's interesting about this is that we can go back to that original set that we talked about, pen and tablet, and it turns out that this set is equal to yet another set. You know, we already established that it's equal to tablet and pen, but there's another set that it's equal to, which is that it's equal to the singleton set of pen unioned with the singleton set of tablet. And just for good measure, let's union it with empty as well. <clears throat> now, there are a large number of other operations that are useful when you're talking about sets. Uh, for example, um, there's also computer's beeping. Uh, there's also the operation intersection, intersection, which kind of takes the idea of and and puts it inside of set. So we write it down as a intersect b, so it's sort of like an upside down u, and for all x, x is inside of a intersect b if and only if x is inside of a and x is inside of b. Okay. So this is yet another way of constructing a set. We can construct a set by taking the empty set, singletons, unions, intersections. Um, now, another thing that we can think about with sets is we want, we, we want to compare two sets. So it's very common to want to do something called the subset operation. I'll say the subset question. So subset is a question that you ask about two sets. So we write it down in the following way. So this symbol right here means subset. and it takes a set and a set and it's a question so that means that it is itself a proposition and it's defined the following way for all sets a and b a is a subset of b if and only if for all x x inside of a implies x inside of b so let's think about uh, some examples of that. Um, so for instance, um, the set pen is a subset of the set pen and tablet because everything that's inside of X is also inside of B. Another one that's interesting is empty is a subset of pen because everything that's inside of A, which in this case is nothing, is also inside of B. Okay. Hmm. What else do we want to talk about? So, subset actually leads to another really important set concept, which is called the power set. 
So a power set we write in the following way. So we say P with like a fancy extra thing on the side, A, or we write, um, uh, we write 2A, so another way of writing it. Um, and that is, that's defined the following way. We say that for all A, for all X, X is inside of the power set of A if and only if X is a subset of A. So this is a really interesting idea. The elements that are inside of A are themselves sets. So for instance, let's look at this set right here, pen tablet. What are the things inside of its power set? Well, one thing is definitely the empty set because we already know that that is inside of everything. We know that pen is inside of it, of the empty set. Sorry, we know that pen is inside of the power set of this. We know that tablet would be in it because that right there is a set. And then there's also pen and tablet. So those four things are the elements of the power set of pen and tablet. Now, if you're familiar with uh, other computer science things, you may um, know the sequence of powers of two. Notice that right here we had two elements and the power set had four elements. That is a stable property. If A has n elements, then the power set of A has two to the n elements. It's kind of an interesting thing. Okay, um, now there's a few more um, uh, things that we'll want to, um, uh, a few more ideas other than um, empty set, uh, union, singletons, intersection, um, uh, you know, the next one. So, oftentimes with sets, we want to talk about um, sort of the opposite of a set. So the opposite of a set is called a complement. Complement. And we write it as A to the C, or A with the bar over it. And we would say the following. We would say, for all X, X is inside of AC if and only if X is not inside of A. Now, complement kind of has a weird thing, which is that all this time that we've been talking about sets, we haven't been really um, particular about what kinds of things the sets are made out of. So for instance, in the example that I've just, just shown, you know, we have the pen and the tablet, but you know, what other things? Can we just write any word? Is it only electronics? What exactly are the things that the set is talking about? That's called the universe. So the universe, written with a U, a really fancy U, um, is the set of things, set of things we are talking about. And all the time before when we said things about um, sets, we really were making reference to a universe. So for instance, we should have said, for all x inside of the universe, x is not inside of the empty set. So here it becomes more clear what we mean. Something is inside of a complement if it's in the universe, but it's not inside of this particular element. Okay. Now, let's remind ourselves like why we're doing this, right? We are just uh, establishing what some of the fundamental discrete math tools that we're gonna use in our studies of the foundations of uh, the foundations of computer science. But computer science doesn't feel like it's, you know, about this kind of thing. It's about, you know, what computers can do. So, um, you know, 
How do we bridge these together? Well, the fundamental thing that we need to think about is we need to think about what is the universe uh, that computations work over. And here's going to be where we're going to do kind of a big idea. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to lay out the I'm going to I'm going to lay out the whole path where we're going to go, and then I'll come back and fill in the pieces. Okay. So computations computations will be sets sets of strings and strings are sequences of characters and characters are elements of an alphabet alphabet and an alphabet is a finite set all right so we just you know, defined a whole bunch of things. So let's start from the bottom and work our way up. So an alphabet is a finite set. So an alphabet is just a fancy name that we're going to give to particular kinds of sets. And what's special about them is just the way that we're going to use them. They're not special in and of themselves. So we always write down a, we were always write down an alphabet using the Greek letter sigma. This is the same sigma that you use for some notation, you know, in uh, calculus class. Okay, so it is a finite set. Now, what do we mean by finite? When we say finite, we mean built with union, the empty set, and um, and uh, singletons. Okay. In other words, it's a set that we can write down the elements. Now, in this class, it's never going to matter what sigma is. Sometimes we'll just have sigma be 0, 1 because it's convenient. Sometimes we'll make it so that sigma is like a smiley face, an unhappy face, you know, someone sticking their tongue out, and, you know, someone exploding. You know what I mean? So just whenever it's convenient, we'll just have sigma be whatever. It's never going to matter. You can imagine that the entire class starts with a giant, for all sigma, all these things are true. Okay, so now the characters are elements of an alphabet. For instance, in this case, the characters would be 0 and 1, for instance. Okay, now the next thing that we need to define is strings are sequences of characters. Okay, so what is a sequence? Uh, there's a fancy way to define a sequence, um, but probably the simplest way to define a sequence um, is to uh, kind of do the same thing that we've been doing before with sets. We wanted to find the simplest kind of thing and then make something a little bit more complicated. So the simplest kind of sequence is written this way. That is the Greek letter epsilon. And it is an empty sequence. It's an empty sequence. If we were programming, then we would write this as just, you know, two quotes with nothing in between them. Okay, so that is a sequence. Okay, so that's how do you get the very small sequence. Then um, there's an operation that we can do on sequences called the concatenation operation. Concatenation. And we write it like this. Actually, let's not do concatenation, sorry. Forget about that. Um, let's say that um, if C X is a string, if C is a character, and X is a string. So for instance, let's uh, get to a new page. So for instance, uh, zero epsilon is a string because epsilon is a string, 
we can put a character and then a string, and then that's a string. Well, if zero epsilon is a string, then that also means that one, one, zero epsilon is a string, because epsilon's a string, zero epsilon is a string, therefore one, zero epsilon is a string, and therefore one, one, zero epsilon is a string. Now, because epsilon doesn't have anything in it, we typically don't write it down. We just would write this one as zero and this one as one, one, zero. We only write down epsilon um, when the string would otherwise be empty. So epsilon is of course a string and you know it's weird to have some, it's weird down here to, um, it's weird down here to like not have anything written there when we're talking about the empty string. So in that case we would write down epsilon. So these are all strings. Now strings, you know, they have, um, they have uh, uh, different properties. So one of their properties is their length. So we write it in this following way. So the length of a string. And it's easy to define the length of the string in the following way. The length of epsilon is equal to zero. And the length of cx is equal to one plus the length of x. Now, um, if we go back to our list of things, so we have alphabet is a finite set, characters are elements of an alphabet, strings are sequences of characters, and then computations are sets of strings. Okay, so that means that a computation is a set of strings. For example, here is a set of strings. And this one happens to be infinite, so I'm just going to write dot 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 and not write it anymore. So this set of strings are all of the strings that are only made up of zeros or they're empty. Now, I said that this is a computation. What does it mean for that to be a computation? Well, let's think of it in the following way. Suppose I ask you the question, is a string made of only zeros? Or alternatively, I could say, are all the characters in a string zero? That is a coherent question that one could ask. It'd be a really dumb, boring program to write, but it certainly is a program that you could write. I could go, I could open up my computer and you know write a program in Java that answers this question. Are all the characters in a string zero? Well, that then is, um, that program would be a particular solution to this problem right here. The, are all the characters in a string zero? What we're gonna do inside of this class is rather than focus on the solution to the problem, we're gonna focus on the problem itself. And so this set right here is the problem, are all the characters in a string zero? And any computation that could identify the elements inside of this would be a solution to that problem. And so we're going to identify computations with problems. And by defining a problem and then asking whether or not you can write down a formal way of describing this problem, it's going to turn out that we can automatically get a solution to that problem as well. And that's what we mean by saying that computations are sets of strings. Now strings are really important um, objects, um, and they're going to have their own set of um, their own set of operations as well. Um, operations uh, like their their own set of uh, things that you can do um, uh, do with them. For example, um, one thing that's common to think about is called concatenation. I mentioned this before. 
So x, circ y, this thing right here is pronounced circ. Okay, so x circ y is a string if x and y are strings. Okay, uh, so for instance, um, if, if we had the string 0, 1, circ 1, 0, then that would be the string 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay, we're going to come back uh, to this operation and many others like it later. Now, one of the things that I think you should do um, in all of your work in this class is you should always combine um, thinking about the math with writing programs to help you um, understand um, uh, understand the uh, understand the math. For me, I find that programming um, helps me make sure that I really understand something. So what you should do is you should um, try to take these ideas and implement them in a programming language. For example, one of the things that you need to do um, is uh, we're going to write simulators um, and implementations of all of the ideas in the class. So in that case, one of the things that you want to do is write down a, a data. We're going to, we're going to, all our programs are going to be about strings and alphabets and these things. So we need to decide how to represent those. So for example, um, you need to, you need to decide um, how to represent, how to represent alphabets, alphabets, and characters. So for example, you could say that an alphabet is going to equal a list of characters. And you could say that a character is just going to be some object um, with a quality and printing. If I were writing this in Java, then um, this is what I would do. Um, characters would just be some arbitrary object because everything in Java has a quality, and then I would add printing to it. Um, and then I could say, and then we'll also define, you know, decide how to represent strings, how to represent strings. And I would say that, you know, a string is going to be a list of characters also. <clears throat> and so that means that now I can put inside of my programming language um, some simple examples, like I could define the alphabet 0 and 1, and then I could write down this, the uh, elements 0 and 1, the characters, and I could define a string 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay. Now, the last thing for today, we're going to define um, every alphabet has a concept called the, the lexicographic ordering. So every alphabet, alphabet has a lexicographic ordering. Intuitively, the lexicographic ordering is all of the strings in the language from shortest to longest in some order. So suppose that sigma was 0 and 1. Let's look at an example of this. So here's the lexicographic ordering. First we would have epsilon, then we would have 0, and then we would have 1. Then we would have 0, 0, then 0, 1, then 1, 0, then 1, 1. Then we would have 0, 0, 0, then 0, 0, 1, then 0, 1, 0, then 0, 1, 1, then 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 
zero. So oops, whoops, one, one, zero, one, one, one. Um, and so on. <clears throat> okay. So this list right here, this sequence, is the lexicographic ordering of this alphabet, zero, one. Now, it's possible to write a function to generate this. Think about how you might do that. So here's one idea that you could do. You could write this, you could write this like a recursive function, where if I said, give me, um, you know, give me all the elements of the fourth layer. So let's say that this is the zeroth layer, and this is the oneth layer, this is the tooth layer, this is the threeth layer, and then what would the fourth layer be? Okay. So what you could do is you could say, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take all the elements of the third layer and add a zero in front of them, and then also add a one in front of them. And then how did we get the third layer? Well, we took all the elements of the tooth layer, and we added a zero in front of them, that's these ones, and then we added a one in front of them, that's those ones. And how did we get the tooth layer? Well, we took all of the elements of the first layer, of the oneth layer, and added a zero in front of them, and then we added a one in front of them. And how did we get the oneth layer? Well, we took all the elements of the zeroth layer and added a zero in front of them, and then added a one in front of them. So that's kind of a recursive way of defining what each layer is. So you could do that. You could write a function that said, you know, give me the sixth layer, and I'm going to produce it by, you know, writing this recursive function to find the previous layers. You should go do that. Okay, what's another, that's kind of a way of writing this function. Um, we could define it in the following way. We could say layer would take in an n and then return um, a sequence of strings. Okay, let's write another, let's think about another function though. We'll call it Lexi. And what Lexi is going to do is it's going to take n and it's going to return the nth string. So for instance, this right here is string number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that right there is the ninth string. So if I called Lexi with 9, I'm going to get that element. Now how could you do that? Well, here's the key idea. The key idea uh, is to realize that if you were given 9, you can figure out what layer it's in by looking at how many elements are in each layer beforehand. For example, you know that the zeroth layer has zero things in it all of the time. So the only time that something is in the zeroth layer uh, is if it is thing number zero. Okay. So that means that if it's not in the zeroth layer, then it must be after that. So it must be the eighth thing after that one. So we'll take the number 9, we'll compare it to the number 0. It's not 0, so therefore we subtract 1 from it and then move over. So we're over here. So then we say, okay, well, is it in the next layer? Well, the only way that it's in the next layer if it is, um, if our new number 8 is smaller than 2. Why is it, what I would say smaller than Because we know that the first layer has two things in it, 0 and 1. So since 8 is not smaller than 2, we know it's after that. So we're going to take 8 and we're going to subtract 2 from it, because there were two things there. So now our new number is 6. And we say, is 6 smaller than 4? And it's not smaller than 4, so we subtract 4 from it. So now we're looking at the number 2. And we say, is 2 smaller than 8? And it is. So therefore we look at the 0, 1, 2 thing. And that's that, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. And boom, we found the thing that we were looking for. So you can operationalize that logic that I just walked through, where you start with the with the number, you compare it to the largest index in a particular layer, and if it's not in that one, then you go to the next layer, and then this allows you to find out which layer something is in in a that in this operate this um, this question is linear in the number of layers. Now you know what layer it's in, and then you just look at the index into that. And how do you generate the index into it? 
Well, one thing that you could do is you could use your layer function, but that's lame, right? That's super lame, okay? A better way to do it is it turns out that this number right here, 2, notice that 0, 1, 0 is the way of writing down the number 2 in base 2 with exactly three digits. So you can implement Lexi by figuring out what layer you're in and then turning your your given index into the number um, written in base whatever the alphabet is. Okay, I'm being, you know, intentionally a little bit vague for you to be able to go write this yourself. So test your knowledge, test your understanding of what we've seen so far by trying to go do that. And I will see you next time uh, where we can talk more. Oh yeah, actually, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, just, we'll just keep going next time. Okay, have a good day.